Have you ever heard about the children born without pain sensitivity? It's an incredibly rare congenital condition. It only affects around 100 people in the whole world. And on the surface, it sounds amazing, right? Like how cool would it be to never feel physical pain? Well, actually, it's a nightmare. These little kids who can't feel pain, they also have nothing to protect them from injury. One of these kids named Isaac, when he was a toddler, he would throw a tantrum and he would smack his face like so hard into the ground that he was almost breaking things. And he would just laugh because he thought it was funny. He would, he would chew on his tongue until it bled. He would poke his fingers into his eyes because they felt weird but he was actually damaging his eyeballs. Now, normally your pain receptors would send a strong message. Stop biting your tongue. Stop poking your eyes. Stop hitting your head. But for him, no pain meant that there was little to stop him from harming himself. Ashlyn is another girl who feels no pain. As a baby, she never cried when she was hungry or when she had a really bad diaper rash. And again, this seems like the ideal baby, right? But then one day they had her into the doctor for a regular checkup and they found out that she had this huge tear on her cornea. And normally this would be incredibly painful, but because she didn't feel pain, she wasn't able to alert her parents to her injuries or her needs. Now Ashlyn and kids like her, they live in danger every day because they don't have the automatic protective alarm system of pain. In her life, Ashlyn has walked for two days on a broken ankle without realizing it. She sat in a pile of fire ants without being bothered by their blistering bites. Kids like her stick their hands on hot stove burners or into boiling water without shedding a tear. And, and their lack of pain creates a real difficulty for them and for their parents who are trying to just keep their kids safe without their children having this internal system to help them. Ashlyn is now 13 and she's learning to cook and take care of herself, but every day they worry that she's gonna get hurt without realizing it. Ashlyn's parents have created a Facebook group for other families with this condition and it's called The Gift of Pain. And it's not until you see what life is like without any pain at all that you can kind of start to appreciate the benefit of pain in your life. Now, while this may seem like an extreme example, I hope it helps you break down this idea of positive and negative emotions a little bit more. Pain is uncomfortable, but it serves a purpose. In this section, in skill number two, we're gonna talk about how every emotion you experience serves a function. In their purest forms, emotions like fear, sadness, joy, love, guilt, hurt, they all serve important roles in our lives. You're gonna learn how to get better at feeling by listening to your innate wisdom, and you're gonna learn why coping skills don't work in the long run. And you're also gonna learn what to do instead. This video is sponsored by Skillshare, where you can learn all sorts of really cool things. Skillshare has a ton of classes on creative arts. Last week when I was traveling, I just tuned in for this class, Podcast Marketing, How to Grow Your Audience with a Marketing Plan by Amanda McLaughlin. This course is about how to market a podcast. As you watch along, you'll be building a marketing plan for your own show. And in 24 minutes, she helped me clarify my voice and my marketing plan to share my podcast with easy, actionable steps. And I've taken a half dozen other classes about podcasting on Skillshare, and I'm loving it. I'm really learning a lot in such a short amount of time. The other cool thing about Skillshare classes is they usually have a project involved. And so you can see the projects that other class members are making. And I think that's a really cool part of these classes. There's also a ton of other classes on productivity, creativity, and self-care. Becoming a Skillshare member is less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. And the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership. So you can explore your creativity and use it to work through through your emotions. You already have within you the inherent ability to resolve and manage your emotions. You have a deep knowledge inside of you that will guide you and help you work through thoughts and emotions with strength and integrity. The problem is that many of us have been taught that there are good emotions and bad emotions, and that gets in the way of us being able to listen to our emotions and honor them. When we focus our energy on making bad feelings go away, we lose track of who we want to be. When we choose to see emotions as functional, instead of just, you know, uncomfortable inconveniences, we use our emotions as a resource 
instead of seeing them as an obstacle. So let's talk about one example of how a so-called negative emotion can actually be really helpful. If I hurt someone, let's say, let's say I punch them in the face for no good reason, I'm gonna feel regret. I'm gonna feel some guilt. Guilt is uncomfortable. Does that make it a negative emotion? Our cultural approach to feeling good says we should try to make the guilt go away. But in this case, the guilt is actually helpful. I did something wrong, I should feel guilty. Now, if I listen to that guilt, it should help motivate me to change my actions, to not do that again, to apologize, to make repairs, to pay their doctor bills or, or whatever. And when I've taken care to resolve that problem, then the guilt will probably naturally dissipate. Every emotion, when it's pure, can serve a function. And when we clean up our emotions, they can guide us to a life of integrity and happiness. Now, in this course, we're gonna learn a lot of ways to clean up distorted emotions. And, and what I'm talking, what, what I mean by that is like, if I have distorted thinking that says like, oh my gosh, everything in the world is terrible and I'm a terrible person, then I'm gonna feel like really depressed. But when we clean up that distorted thinking, then I might just feel a little bit sad about something that's happening in the world. And that sadness is a beautiful and pure emotions. So before we can move into those sections in the course, this section is essential because first we just have to talk about the function of emotions. Okay, so let's talk about that. The function of guilt is to ask, did I do something wrong? And then if yes, I need to fix it and make repairs. And if the answer is no, that I, you know, I, I didn't do something wrong, then when we really address that guilt, we'll be able to let it go. The emotion of fear or anxiety asks, am I in danger? It says, look out. It asks, is this actually dangerous? Now, I want my daughters to feel some anxiety. I want them to feel scared on a cliff edge so they don't go too close or to worry a little bit about cars so they don't run into the street. So when you feel anxious, you ask, is this actually dangerous? If yes, then take action to create safety. Fight off the danger. Run away from the danger. Leave it, right? Freeze up and, and hold still until the danger passes. If it's not dangerous, then it's imagined danger. And we need to manage our response. If we, if we sit with that fear and say, oh, actually I am safe, and we calm our body and we calm our mind, then that fear and anxiety will most likely resolve. And whether something is dangerous or safe, we need to check our values to see what's most important to us. Do we need to face our fears to live the life we want? Or is it better to be extra safe in some situations? We'll just do a couple more examples, right? Excitement, also known as stress, pre prepares us to perform. Love motivates us to sacrifice for something we care about. It asks, you know, is this worth committing to? Is this worth sacrificing for? Even hopelessness can serve a function. It asks, should I keep trying? Now, you can't build a bridge across a river with Ritz crackers. You should feel hopeless after trying this a number of times. Hopelessness will motivate you to stop wasting that effort and to try something else. So instead, try using steel beams or trees or rocks or whatever, right? That's the function of hopelessness. But false hopelessness is giving up when it's still possible. This is usually what we see with a depressive disorder, right? We feel this distorted sense of hopelessness about life or yourself, when the truth is your life is actually okay. Your life is good. There's, there's hope for good things to happen. Emotions serve at least three important functions. The first is as warning signs to help us notice problems. The second is they motivate us to change. The word emotion has the word, like that Latin word mo motion in it. I don't know Latin that well, but the, the word emotion is literally about movement, about creating movement. And third, emotions help us connect to other human beings. This is one of the reasons why coping skills don't work in the long run. Here's another example. Um, let's assume that you feel very angry because your child has been given an unfair grade at school. Um, you're friends with the other moms of the other kids in, your, in the same class. And when you compare the assignments, it's clear that the teacher gave him an F and others A's when the level of work was the same. And you know, you're upset because this low grade might impact his ability to go to college and that's really important to you. Now, if you Google right now, if you search how to deal with anger, everything you read will say that if you're angry, you should either express it, you know, like vent or tell someone about it, or two, that you should cope. You should go for a run, you should punch a pillow, you should listen to some calming music, you should distract yourself. 
If this is your approach, and especially if this is your only approach, then the problem never gets solved. Coping skills just bury problems and emotions only to have them, you know, resurface later. So in this case, we can explore some constructive alternatives. If we pause and look at the anger, where is it coming from? Anger is often about fairness and protection. If we listen to what the emotion is telling us, then some options open up. With anger, we always need to check to see if it's a secondary emotion. So that means an emotion covering up another more tender emotion. We're gonna learn like so much more about this in skill number seven. But basically, before we try to solve the problem, just check to see if the anger you're feeling isn't really fear or guilt or disappointment. Those emotions beg for a different solution. Now, if it is anger and this is about protection, perhaps the right solution is righting the wrong, making sure that you stand up for your child who's being mistreated or that you confront the teacher. I mean, we're just talking about options here, right? Another option is maybe the right thing to do is help your child find safety by changing classes or schools. Or you could encourage your child to help him feel more confident to um, talk to his teacher about the issue. Now, another option, look at this. When we look at what anger is trying to do, it's about protection. It gives us options for how to act. Maybe the solution is actually that you need to change your perspective. Uh, you need to look at this problem from a different point of view. And you might even see that what you thought to be mistreatment was actually fair or helpful when you view it honestly. So let's say you call or email the teacher and you politely ask them for clarification. You find out that the teacher caught your son cheating. This new perspective gives you lots of new options for action to solve the problem that have nothing to do with the teacher, right? This solution, this like looking for a different perspective on emotions, it's often the most helpful and often the most difficult to do on our own. And then again, with anger, in some rare circumstances, the problem is completely out of our control. And the best thing we can do is open up some space to feel those emotions, let them pass through without us taking action. We can help our child understand that the world isn't fair, but we can try to live by that value of fairness. We can try to be that change in the world. Or you can go to school board meetings and you know try to influence the big picture problem of teacher training. If we really look carefully at the root of the anger emotion, then it gives us so many options for action on the problem instead of just suppressing that emotion itself. When we pause to explore the emotion, we suddenly have so many more available responses instead of just, you know, react or suppress, right? Pausing and exploring is really important and we're gonna practice that throughout the course. Now, in the next sections of this course, we're gonna ask, what if I can't figure out where this emotion is coming from? And what if I can't take action? Okay, so what if I can't take action? What if I know what the function of this emotion is, but I can't take action? Um, what am I supposed to do if I can't solve my problem? What if it's out of my realm of control? If it's just someone's choices that made me hurt, can I cope then? Well, I would answer this by saying that coping implies active suffering combined with trying not to think about it. Suppression usually leads to explosions later. So instead of coping, I would encourage you to find active peace combined with a focus on living the life you value. Using your willingness skills to make space for that pain will help it dissipate instead of, you know, make it something that you just have to keep pushing off or carrying around with you. Your emotions aren't out to get you. There's a very high chance that your mind is not broken or defective. And when we think of emotions as good or bad, we tend to try to create change at the emotional level. We try to make those emotions go away. When we just try to stop an emotion, it's like trying to get rid of an iceberg by cutting off the top. But all that ice underneath keeps resurfacing. If we see emotions and behaviors as functional, we can create change at a deeper level. We tend to resolve problems because we see an emotion as simply an indication that there's something we need to change. Both approaches to emotional change take work, right? Coping or resolving emotions. The difference is that coping creates a cycle that's not sustainable. It usually is built on short-term fixes. It's fine in the short-term crisis. I'm not trying to say never cope. Coping is fine when you're in crisis. Um, it relies on things that make us feel better now. But in the long run, we need to keep feeding that coping. And this keeps all our energy focused on emotional control and we're completely distracted from the direction we wanna go with our life. Resolving emotions focuses on acknowledging problems as a step on the road to solving them. 
It creates a sustainable change that leads to more and more fulfillment as time goes on. Okay, question number two. What if I can't figure out where an emotion is coming from? Like, how can I understand the function of an emotion if I don't know why I'm feeling it or where it's coming from? Now, there's a couple options here. Option number one is you've been doing what you're doing for so long that you've got this serious backlog of fish trucks and there's so much history there that it's hard to even tell them apart. So like, this is common with depression or generalized anxiety disorder or, you know, trauma. And the solution is to just get started shoveling. Start processing emotions one at a time and it's gonna start making a big difference. Um, and the, the first way to practice this is through the emotion tracker, right? Um, option number two, you might be having a pure emotion that comes from being human. It's not a sign that something's wrong or that you're doing anything wrong or something needs to change. This is a beautiful aspect of being alive. It's laughing so hard that milk comes out your nose and sobbing so hard when you lose someone you care about. The solution to this kind of emotions is don't make these emotions try to go away. They're a beautiful part of being alive. Instead, increase your willingness skills and your emotions will no longer feel disabling. Now, I'm gonna talk a lot more about willingness in skill number four and five, so stay tuned for that. Okay, number three, if you can't figure out where this emotion is coming from, your emotion might be a secondary emotion. The solution to this is to explore the emotions and see uh, if there's something else there, if there's something deeper. The closer we get to the core emotions, the more sensitive they are, but the greater power we have to take action. Now, you may be wondering, how does this apply to depression or anxiety disorders? And I'm not trying to say that a depressive disorder or an anxiety disorder is functional, but I will say that often the primary core root emotions of sadness or fear they can be very functional when we learn to use them in the right way. But there's a lot that we do to exaggerate, distort, or feed th those emotions. And, and that can lead to us drowning in them. So I consider depression disorders and anxiety disorders as often, you know, created emotions or distorted emotions. Um, this, this can be pain that we create. By, by something we're doing. Now that's not always the case. Obviously there's a hundred causes of depression and anxiety, but when we're making our pain worse, it's called, you know, pain that we create. In, in this course, we're gonna go into a lot more detail about how you can clean that pain up and resolve many of those distorted emotions. But we can't do any of that if we don't understand the function or the purpose of those root emotions. Now on a side note, some people are just born more or less emotionally sensitive, right? Some people are born, some people are more prone to be anxious and others less anxious. And I also think this serves an important function in the community. If we have 100 people in our village and 10 of them are extra anxious and 10 of them are extra unanxious, they're, you know, the group that's rarely bothered or worried. The 10 extra anxious people might be more likely to raise a warning when something's about to go wrong, or they'll keep a closer eye on the children to keep them from falling off a cliff. And that serves a role in our community, right? And the 10 unanxious people probably would make good warriors or hunters, but they maybe would have a harder time getting along with other people in the village, right? People who have extremely low or no anxiety tend not to worry about how they impact the people around them, and they can even end up as, as sociopaths. Now, as a community, we can value these differences and find good roles for them instead of, in, in, instead of labeling some as good and some as bad. It is fair to say that some emotions are comfortable and some are uncomfortable to have. And in that sense, some are easier to experience and others take more energy, they're more challenging. But I want you to ask yourself right now, has trying to get rid of uncomfortable emotions made your life better? Emotions are not bad, they can be functional. When we stop getting in the way of their inherent purpose and we flow with them, then we're able to live better lives of meaning and integrity. And as an added bonus, we're often able to resolve them. In your workbook, explore one of the recent intense emotions that you had. What purpose could it have? What was it trying to accomplish or show you? What kind of action did it seem to be asking for? Okay, I look forward to working with you on the next skill. Thank you for watching and take care.